So welcome to today's lecture about convolutional and recurrent neural networks. And these two type of architectures, these two types of neural networks are uh, the most commonly used, I would say, uh, nowadays. Uh, either you want to, for example, classify images or you want to deal with time series data. And this is the way to go when you do something like this. Um, and I will start with convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks are uh, sometimes called ConfNets or CNNs. And illustrated here is what uh, is learned in convolutional neural networks. And um, illustrated here are uh, some kind of uh, combination of feature maps and activations. And instead of simple neurons, now you use convolutions in this network and these convolutions are able to capture spatial structures. And depending on uh, the deepness uh, or the, the, um, the deepness of the layer you're looking at, you can see that a different, uh, a different complexity of structures is captured. So in the first layer, you can see simple edges are captured, some simple structures, not very specific for, for some classes, but in intermediate layers, you can see that the structures are more complex, which are captured. And in uh, deeper layers, you can even see whole object structures. So for example, in the, um, in the bottom right corner, uh, you can see structures of faces. And this lecture will show you how CNNs uh, work and how these structures are learned. And I want to start with a toy example, a very simple example. And what you can see here is the satellite image showing an area in Saudi Arabia. And we want to classify parts of the image into the class desert or agriculture field. And when you have a deeper look, you can see that all these agriculture fields uh, are, has this round shape um, and they receive the shape due to this pivot irrigation. And yeah, it, if you have an even um, more detailed look, you can exactly see they have a perfect nice round shape. And Let's have a look at um, yeah, the basic uh, structure. What happens when you apply a CNN? Uh, your input is an image. A uh, typical example for uh, grid, uh, gridded um, input data. Of course, you can also use uh, other kind of input data, but images are yeah, the perfect example for gridded uh, data. And uh, so an image is nothing else than a 2D array of, uh, of pixels, of values. Uh, if you have more than one spectral channel, you uh, have a 3D array, but still gridded structure. And by looking at this image, the CNN can decide if it belongs uh, to class one agriculture area or class two desert. Um, and by looking at the complete image, you can see that there are a lot of round objects, but all these objects differ a little bit from each other because sometimes they are translated, they are scaled, they are rotated, and they, sometimes they even have a different spectral appearance. But in the end, I hope we agree that they all have this round structure. And so they contain similar structures and the trick what CNNs use is that they compare parts of the images uh, rather than the whole thing. And um, so the CNN, what it does is it finds similar parts uh, which characterize the, the whole image. And the math behind this uh, is convolution or also called uh, filtering. And because of this mathematical operation, we are able to capture all these typical structures which uh, describe the image. And if we perform a convolution for the whole image, we get an, an impression how well the filter fits to specific parts uh, of the image. So here, for example, you can see we have uh, given uh, a filter a typical filter for this image and a part of the image. And then if you apply this convolution, you get a feature map. 
And this feature map is nothing else than a map which indicates where the filter actually resamples the image. And so you can see bright spots are actually where the, the filter fits quite well to the image and the dark spots where you have a huge difference between the filter and the image. And in the end, you have here 10 bright spots, which makes sense because you have a filter which shows exactly one of these agricultural fields and in the image you have 10 of these agricultural fields. And in the CNN, we do not have only one filter, but we have a lot of these filters. And so the whole convolution is also repeated with other filters. And when you apply different filters to an image, you get such a feature map stack. Um, and these feature maps are used as a stack uh, and uh, creating a stack of filtered images. And this is actually what happens in a convolutional layer. So in a convolutional layer, you apply multiple times with multiple filters convolutions. And the sign you can see here, this, uh, yeah, the circle with a cross in it is uh, a typical sign standing for convolution. So if you read articles about convolutional neural networks, sometimes you will uh, find the sign for convolutions. So now we have a stack of uh, feature maps, each feature, feature map belonging to one filter. And it's not only that we do it once, um, because we are talking about deep neural networks. So we do not have only uh, one um, operation and one convolutional um, and one convolutional layer. No, we do it one after each other, each other. So we have a stack of these operations. Um, so we have uh, one layer where we apply convolutions and these feature maps are the input to the next layer and we apply convolutions again and these feature maps are again used as input into the next layer. So you apply these filters one after each other so that you extract features from features. And in this way you are able to extract uh, a lot of very complex uh, uh, structures and uh, features which are relevant for the task you want to solve. But it's not only that you can only use uh, convolutions in a convolutional neural network. At some point you want to make a decision and we talked about we want to make a decision into two classes, class one agriculture area and class two desert. So what you need is a dense layer. Uh, the dense layer is nothing else than you take the last um, uh, convolutional layer, the output, the feature maps, and then you flatten them. Flattening means you uh, vectorize them and you concatenate them. Um, and each feature value gets now one uh, vote for each class. So you see they are all connected to the last two output neurons, which are exactly your two classes. And Imagine you have a training uh, training image uh, showing an agriculture area. You want to have, hopefully, uh, you get them also high values for uh, pointing to this class. So you have high votes for this class. And when you have an image of a desert, you want to have high votes for the um, class two, the desert. So this is the, the basic uh, principle what is happening in a convolutional neural networks. But of course, um, I will now, uh, there are other possibilities and I will now show you some more details because um, there are a lot of possibilities which makes a convolutional neural network much more powerful. Um, yeah. So, so far all pixels uh, are categorized. So you have an image and we decided on a class, so image categorization. But what if you want to do image uh, segmentation, semantic segmentation, um, so for each pixel you want to decide to which class it belongs. So for this we need to change the concept a little bit, the, um, yeah, the, the architecture, and there are different possibilities. Um, the first possibility to do this is just a sliding window categorization. Um, so what you need is you uh, divide the image into image patches 
and then you apply a separate network to each single image patch. Um, but this is super inefficient because imagine you have overlapping patches and in the overlapping patches when you apply convolutions, a lot of convolutions are um, performed multiple times. So this is and these uh, operations are not shared among all these um, um, separately applied uh, networks. So it's super inefficient. You, you're doing operations which are, which are actually not necessary because you already pre performed them. So in the end, this is not a good idea. So we need, um, yeah, this is too inefficient and we need much more efficient operations. The second possibility is that you apply a bunch of convolutional layers to make predictions for all pixels at once. Um, so your input image is yeah, the whole image with the height, the width and uh, the free indicating the RGB channels. Every time when I talk about this input image, uh, please note that you can also have um, multispectral, hyperspectral images. So uh, the extension is straightforward because you just apply different type of convolutions. But for simplicity here, I uh, only show uh, one channel images or three channel images. So you have your input image and um, then you have multiple convolutional layers and the, convol uh, the convolutions inside um, as the, the uh, feature maps which are determined has the same size as the, as the input image. Um, uh, and then as the last layer you have, um, yeah, you get, uh, you need some scores because you, you want to make a decision for each pixel. And these uh, scores have the dimension of the height times the width as the same as the image and times C and C is the number of classes. And if you apply an arc max uh, operation, you can uh, decide uh, which class each pixel belongs to. Um, this is also very computationally expensive because each convolutional layer is as big as the input. Um, so we need we need to um, yeah we need to find a better solution even if this is uh, a better solution than the first one we still want to speed it up even more and instead uh, of using the first or the second possibility there's a better choice of networks illustrated here and this is not only this this kind of network is much more computational efficient it's also it has some more nice properties leading exactly to the ability to extract this hierarchy of features um, as i showed you in the beginning so here what you can see uh, you have some down sampling um, strategies and some up sampling of uh, strategies for feature maps inside the network. So it's not that you have uh, the same size of feature map all the time. And instead uh, of doing the convolutions of feature maps, having this, uh, the whole size um, of the image all the time, we uh, use smaller feature maps. And because you use smaller feature maps, you have less mathematical operations and then you are much more efficient. And But to achieve uh, an output which is of the same size when you downsample it at some point you also need to upsample it because you want to have a decision for each pixel position. So we need uh, to increase the feature maps again. So the first part of the CNN is typ uh, typically contains blocks of uh, operations which are illustrated here. So it's not that you uh, randomly uh, apply different uh, layers, mostly there is some structure in it and uh, in many cases it is structures block wise. So we have blocks of this containing the same operations and then they are repeated several times. And a typical block in a convolutional neural network contains of uh, first you apply convolution, then you apply a nonlinear activation, for example a ReLU operation, and then you do the downsampling. We will talk about uh, downsampling strategies in the next slides, but here you can see uh, this is a typical block and when you um, 
um, have a sequence of su such blocks, you um, yeah you have some nonlinear operations and then you downsample it, and again nonlinear operations, downsampling, and so on. So you do this deep stacking of all these uh, layers. So I want to talk a bit, a little bit more why the stone sampling is uh, a really good idea. And I told you already that down sampling reduces the complexity in the network because you have less mathematical operations. Um, but there's another nice property. When the convolutional filter size stays the same, the recepted field increases in deeper layers. So here you can see uh, the same filter size illustrated in um, yeah, dark, dark gray and applied to a large feature map on the left side and a smaller feature map on, on the right side. And what you can see is that the recepted field, uh, which is exactly the filter size, um, is here the same, but the the amount or, uh, or the extent of the image which is applied or where you uh, apply the the convolution increases, and so you have generally you you have two choices when you want to have a larger receptive feed. Either you make uh, the filter larger, or uh, you increase the, uh, de decrease the image size, and then uh, the filter size stays the same. And the second one is much more efficient. And if you combine it, uh, so if you uh, let the if the filter size uh, stays the same, and if you combine it with the depth, you can extract more complex structures, giving you a result similar to the example I showed you in the early beginning. So this is a nice property. Combining the stone sampling with depth and then you get such nice features. Um, and exactly because of this, uh, it's a wise idea to increase the number of filters with the depth. Um, remember that the receptive field increases. Uh, that means the spatial information captured by the convolutions also increases. Uh, in the early beginning, uh, you because the receptive field is quite small, um, and also the uh, the depth is not so not so high. Um, you have some kind of edge detector, uh, edge detector, and edge detections work for our classes. So edges are not very specific for for some for some classes. Um, so it's when you only look at edges, it's you can hardly tell if it's uh, which class it belongs to. Um, but high-level concepts, very complex features, work uh, are specific for um, for some classes. So, for um, the more complex and more specific the features uh, you extract, the better you can describe a specific class. And you need much more filters and deeper layers to capture as many possible structures characterizing the image content. So complex structures are not very redundant as edges are. So you need a lot, a lot more filters to get all these and to extract all these uh, features you want uh, to have to characterize um, yeah, your input data. And let's go back to this downsampling and upsampling uh, strategies. And the concept behind the downsampling is that you summarize information and you um, in a specific area. Uh, so you make the current representation more compact. And that means also you only focus on the important information. And this is exactly the same concept I show you here um, with this learning the new representation, more compact representation. It's the same concept I showed you for the autoencoders with the encoding part and the decoding part. This our class uh, architecture with the bottleneck layer. Same principle here. Um, so, but here you say you have an encoding convolutional neural network and a decoding convolutional net neural network. Um, the procedures are, uh, and the whole network is mostly symmetric. So when you have a downsampling procedure, uh, 
generally you use the opposite um, procedure for upsampling. So when you, for example, choose um, uh, pooling as a downsampling strategy, normally you have an unpooling as upsampling strategy. So I want to uh, go into detail in for exactly two, um, yeah, two uh, downsampling and upsampling strategies. That's uh, pooling and unpooling, and convolutions and uh, deconvolution. So convolutions can also be used for downsampling. Um, so what do you what you want to achieve, as I already told you, is you want to shrink the image stack. So you want to downsample and uh, reduce the current feature maps to the most important information. Pooling is a nice, uh, nice operation. It's uh, mostly you use a max pooling or a mean pooling, and it means nothing else than in a specific window, you just take the mean value or the maximum value. Pooling layers are defined by a stride and the window size. So the window size is just uh, the area where the pooling uh, operation is um, applied to. And the stride is uh, where exactly or, um, yeah, the, where exactly the uh, operation is performed. So when you have a stride of one, you apply to each possible position in the image on the feature map. If you have a stride of two, you always jump by two pixels. So it's not at each position that you apply the operation. And here you can see one example for pooling. So this is uh, a feature map, an example feature map, and uh, you have a two times two window. And then you take, um, uh, do, you perform a max pooling operation. So uh, bright indicates high values and dark indicating uh, low values. It means you have a, a bright uh, value, which is the maximum. You jump by two now because we chose on the stride two. And if you perform it um, at all positions, you can see that you end up with a um, smaller feature map than the input. So you start with five times five and because you used a stride larger than one, you have a smaller, um, a, f a smaller feature map afterwards. And um, when you do this pooling, uh, as I told you, you need the, um, or it's not that you need it, but it's very wise to do it, uh, the opposite operation for the, for the decoding part. So you need an unpooling. So how do you uh, increase it? Uh, there are different, uh, different pos possibilities to increase your feature map. Uh, here's an example where you have a two times two receptive field. That means you have a two times two um, a window and you want to increase it. So the output is four times four. Um, when you increase the feature maps, you will fill the missing values, uh, for example, with nearest neighbors. So when you, um, yeah, here you can see the example, you just uh, use for the spots where you have a missing value, you use uh, the number which is closest to, um, yeah, which is closest to exactly the position where you search for a value. Then there's a uh, max and pooling. Here you uh, remember where the maximum value was extracted at which position. And so you, you just uh, increase the feature map uh, you remember where was the where was the position? You uh, yeah you apply the the value you have given, and all the missing values are filled with zero. Similar strategy, uh, not so um, sophisticated, is the bed of nails. So you just uh, decide on one position where you uh, use the uh, the feature map value you already have, and then the rest is filled uh, with zeros. And this reminds of a bed of nails. That's why uh, that's why you have this name. So these are different strategies. Um, remember, for the uh, for the max unpooling, you uh, of course need to store also the position if you want to apply it. Um, then, besides pooling, uh, you can also use convolutions. 
Uh, the difference between a pooling and convolution for downsampling is that for pooling you don't need parameters, but for convolutions you need. Um, so when you perform normal convolutions, you have a stride of one, um, but when you use a stride larger than one, this causes a downsampling. Um, Remember, the, the stride defines where you apply the operations and um, stride 1 means at each position and stride 2 is that you jump uh, by 2 pixels when applying uh, the operation. So here you have given um, a 4 times 4 input and uh, you have a recepted field, a filter of 3 times 3 and when you apply it, uh, you end up with, uh, with, one, uh, with one value. And so here we use a stride of two and if you apply these operations you end up with the output of two times two. So this is the downsampling operation. You can also use uh, convolutions as upsampling. Um, it's a little bit tricky uh, because uh, the community in the early beginning did not really decide on a good name for this operation. I call it deconvolution, but there are also other words like up convolution, transpose convolution or backward strided convolution. But it's not an inverted convolution. This is uh, not the best name because there's nothing like an inverted operation to a convolution. So it's not that once you apply the convolution you can invert this and end up with the same input. That's, uh, that's not possible. So uh, it's better to stick to the other names and the other yeah, terms for this deconvolution. So um, what you, what you have here, you have an input of 2 times 2 and you have a filter of 3 times 3 and the deconvolution uh, is nothing else than you multiply this, uh, the value in the input image with the filter. And uh, in the overlapping areas, uh, you sum where yeah, the, over, the output overlaps. Of course, then you will have some um, border uh, artifacts, but in, in the middle uh, you will end up with a deconvoluted feature map. So this is uh, the way how you upsample uh, the the image with the operation, and you can yeah you can uh, use this uh, several times as I showed you with the blocks. So you do some downsampling procedures and you do some upsampling, and in the end you end up with an output which has the same input output size as the input size. So I, so far I was only talking about the operations, but now let's talk about what actually needs to be learned. Um, the filters, it's not necessary that you need to think about what filters are, are good to use in my image. Not like these filter banks I showed you in one of the last lectures. Here the filters are learned and this is a quite nice property because it's also interesting to have a look later on uh, what the network has learned. So the filter weights are learned, uh, the weights in the uh, fully connected or the dense layer, so the last layer um, which is, uh, performs uh, the classification for you. If you use pooling you don't need uh, parameters, so it's not that you, you don't need to learn it, but if you use convolutions as upsampling um, there is a possibility also to learn these uh, filters if not set uh, by you, for example, when you use the same filters as for uh, the encode, uh, encoding part of the convolutional neural network. How is it done? Via backpropagation. And that's quite nice. So once you understood the, the concept of this backpropagation, you can use it to learn a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of um, nice properties and uh, the, the weights in the neural network. There are some hyperparameters, of course. Uh, when you when you uh, uh, remember something from the last lectures, is that it's not that easy to set the hyperparameters for a neural network. And some hyperparameters you need to think about are um, the number of filters, the size of the filters, and the window stride. The window stride only if you use uh, the convolutions as, as downsampling and upsampling. 
Um, the number of filters, as I told you, increases with uh, increasing depth. So you're sure uh, you uh, are able to capture the main characteristics of your input data. For pooling, you need to decide on the window size and the window stride. So interesting um, is also that a lot of researchers actually end up with the some uh, same uh, rules of thumb. Um, for example, that for uh, for pooling uh, or for the number of filters, there's mostly a factor of two or four or eight. So when you, for example, have um, 20 filters in the first layer, you have, uh, it's good to choose uh, the, the uh, double amount and then uh, um, again, double the number of filters in the next layer and so on. So it's, it's quite nice. It's not that you uh, need to think that much about it. It's not that important in the end if you choose 50 filters or 55. Um, it's mostly much easier if you have some structure and uh, behind us how to choose all these uh, all these numbers. Okay, that's uh, about convolutional neural networks. Very nice idea um, and nice architecture to extract uh, spatial um, structures. But what if we have time series data? So what we talked about uh, so far is um, we ignored the time, uh, either because it wasn't there or we just ignored it. If we have, uh, yeah, if we had uh, time series data or some sequence information. So it happens very often in remote sensing that you have some observations and these observations were taken over time. Even if you think of videos, videos uh, contain a lot of images and these images have a sequence. And so when you do a forecasting and remote sensing, uh, you're interested in future uh, observations of future time set, what will happen in future. Um, and the sequence is important. And sequence means there is some temporal structure in it. It's not that you, uh, when, you when you mix it, you get the same result. No, the, the sequence is really important. And when we have a look at specific areas, such as remote sensing for agriculture applications, we can see that we have uh, sequential patterns. So if there are patterns in time, it's, very, it's a very good idea to use them. And so one example is um, the vegetation cover, observed from a far away sensor, for example, a UAV or satellite image. Here you have mixed pixels um, due to the limited spatial resolution of the sensor. So when you, um, for example, take an image of an agriculture field, you will end up with mixed pixels and in each pixel you will have a soil and vegetation. If you have a time series uh, of these uh, images you take, you will realize plants grow. So the amount of vegetation will uh, get bigger in one mixed pixel. When you have a look at this infrared reflection, you can see in this bispectral plot um, where you have the infrared reflection and the red re reflection that um, uh, the amount of the infrared reflection in this mixed pixel increases over time. And this, is a, this plot is called tacit cap because it looks like a tacit cap. And so it's not that uh, it will do some random uh, stuff. It's, it's, uh, you have this nice temporal structure and it's, it would be good to use it. So you know a plant grows. So it's, it's very wise to use this information and uh, you have this information that the amount of this infrared reflection, which is uh, typical for plants that they have a high value, this, that was, this will increase in this mixed pixel. So good idea to use time series data. Um, so when we use neural networks for time series analysis, uh, you have different possibilities. The um, one possibility is recurrent neural networks. These are the, yeah, the standard basic uh, algorithm used for time series analysis, short RNNs. And then you have long short-term memory networks. This is a more sophisticated um, 
yeah, network um, similar to recurrent neural network, but a um, little bit more complicated. But also you can use um, all these um, yeah, uh, nice uh, properties or convolutional neural networks and just treat the spatial information um, as the temporal information. So it's you, you, um, you have this pattern, this time not that you have a spatial pattern, but you have a pattern in time. So you can use convolutions also in time. And then you end up with uh, temporal CNNs. Of course, you can also uh, combine convolution with recurrent neural networks. So you're not restricted and you can get very creative with it. So what is now the difference between this feedforward neural networks and recurrent neural networks? The name indicates how uh, the information is channeled. So feedforward, it means uh, you, the information goes in one direction. So you have an input and it goes to the output. There's not that you have uh, additional time series information coming in between. So you have one input at one time step and then it goes to uh, the output. It's not designed for sequences. Um, it's, uh, of course, you can get some workarounds and use uh, time as, as features, but mm, it, it's not a good idea. Uh, at some point, you will, uh, you, will, um, uh, you will have limits in modeling this time series, and uh, it's way better to use uh, neural networks, which are exactly de designed to deal with sequences. Um, a feedforward neural network, because it does not include time uh, information, is uh, does not model me memory. So it does not remember what happened a few time steps ago. RNNs, uh, in contrast, are especially designed for sequences and they extract also information from it. So they have a, uh, they have a memory and they remember what happened and uh, they um, exactly use this and extract features from it. Um, what uh, the basic idea behind it is that the current input from the current time step is uh, combined with uh, what has been learned before. And what has been learned before is stored in a hidden state. So the hidden state is what you have learned in the, in the hidden layers, the, the your hidden representation from the last time step. And so you combine the new and the old and mix them and this is, uh, and then this is transported over time. But we will have a, uh, a more detailed look at it. So this is the basic principle when you have only one time step. So you have an input and you have uh, a lot of hidden layers and then you have an output. So it goes uh, only in one direction, but um, when you have multiple time steps, you um, we can start thinking about okay, what what is the what is the mathematical formulation for one uh, for one time step? So let's assume uh, for now, for simplicity, that we have only one hidden neuron. So when you write it down mathematically, so y tilde is computed by a nonlinear transformation f uh, of a multiplication of the parameters at w x and the uh, input x t. So t is the time step. This is very similar to um, the standard uh, neural network, feedforward neural network. So now you have uh, another time step, the time step before. So again, you, your input is x uh, t minus 1 and the output is y t minus 1. Um, so how can you now combine and integrate this information? This is done by looking at the hidden state. So you combine the hidden states. You have uh, the hidden state from the previous time step, which is h t minus one, and from the uh, from the uh, current time step is h t. Um, <clears throat> so for the um, previous time step, uh, you have parameters w h. So w, um, you have a multiplication of uh, w, wh and you multiply it with the hidden state from the previous time step, h t minus one. And this is combined uh, in, uh, this is combined for, to compute the new hidden state. So 
uh, the uh, the right part in the equation is x uh, is exactly uh, the combination of uh, learned parameters and the previous hidden state, and uh, this w x times x t is exactly the information you have from um, yeah from the current time step, and so the the current time step and the previous time step are combined, and they are not only combined in a very simple uh, way, there's an additional um, nonlinear transformation, FH. Um, yeah, this whole, uh, this whole equation is used to update um, the current hidden state. So you have all information from these two time steps to compute and to update the current state. Um, important to mention here is this, uh, the parameters, WH. So w, uh, WH is used um, yeah, to connect these hidden states. Um, they are the same in a recurrent neural network. So it's not that you uh, learn them in each time step uh, again and again. No, you learn it for the whole network and for all time steps, uh, they are the same. Yeah, and the final output, um, in case you want to have it, um, is then that you use the, the current um, the current state ht and co uh, multiply with learned weights wy. Okay, um, so what you find in the literature is more often this uh, this left um, illustration that you have uh, this loop and. Um, so the green part is this RNN module. This is exactly what I showed you, where all this, um, yeah, um, uh, where the information is combined. So called RNN module, and uh, here the trans, uh, the information is transported, and the memory, um, yeah, is also transported through time. And uh, so you have the compact representation on the left side and you have the unfolded representation of this network architecture on the right side. So both uh, illustrate the same, but mostly for simplicity in the literature, you find uh, the illustration on the left side. And this unfolded architecture uh, can be thought of uh, multiple copies of the same network and each passing a message to the successor. And of course, we were, we are talking about deep neural networks. So um, so far, I showed I showed you only a very simple network with one hidden neuron, but uh, RNNs can also be uh, deep. So what you do is you stack multiple of these RNN modules, but of course you can also uh, include other modules like uh, convolutional layers and so on. It's just the difference is that here the RNN modules are connected over time and when you um, add um, other, yeah, other layers and other operations, they are not connected. And also uh, um, how does backpropagation work in, in this uh, network? So it's not that you uh, do it uh, for each time step, um, one after each other. What you do is uh, you ha do a back prov uh, propagation uh, in time. So for all time steps, you comp compute um, uh, the gradients and do this back propagation pass. And then yeah, they are passed to the hidden layers and all these weights there and they are passed through time. So it's that you combine them all together. And this is actually uh, some kind uh, of problem because uh, here you uh, multiply a lot, uh, a lot of uh, these gradients, so it can happen um, quite uh, fast that you, um, due to the multiplication, you have uh, gradients in a range which are not uh, good for computation, not good for updating. But we will talk about this later. Uh, this is one reason why recurrent neural networks are not used that often anymore. But uh, you have other possibilities, um, yeah, other modules based on recurrent neural networks, um, which, um, yeah, uh, deal in a in a uh, in a better way with the gradients. But first of all, I want to show you uh, why recurrent neural networks are also very nice because they are quite flexible regarding input and output length. 
So it's uh, we. It's not only that you have one input and one output. We can have also sequences, and there are different um, combinations. Uh, so this is uh, what you see here: at the standard um, input output. So you have one to one, one input, one output. This is the vanilla neural network. That means the basic neural network, and you can use it, for example, for image categorization. So I have one image, and uh, this is one input, and the output is a class. For example, uh, um, a leaf of um, a healthy leaf uh, of an apple tree, or um, a diseased leaf, a tomato plant, and so on. So one input, one output. When you use recurrent neural networks, you can have one input and many outputs. So this uh, one-to-many mapping. Um, one example is image captioning. Image captioning is um, yeah quite active research area with um, for a few years now, and that means you have given an image and then uh, your network generates um, a text. And a text is uh, not only one output. It's uh, uh, yeah, it's a you have a lot of outputs, so it's a sequence of outputs. So, for example, when you when you apply it to um, remote sensing, close range remote sensing, you can um, receive an image, and you can output. There are many barriers in the image; some are not ripe. So you have uh, the object in the image uh, barriers, and then you uh, the network decides ripe or not. Something like this. That's a, that's a very easy uh, basic principle of image captioning. Then you have the possibilities of many outputs to uh, to one uh, many inputs to one output. This uh, many to one mapping. This can be used, for example, for now casting. When you do now casting, is that you look at your previous inputs and then you decide for the current point in time, um, for example, about the health status of your plan. So what you can take into account is, for example, um, a time series of rainfall of the last days, and then the output is, it didn't rain, that's why uh, my my plant is stressed, it has drought stress, uh, if it rained too much, maybe it has uh, water stress. So that's quite nice, because you take into account the sequence and not only um, yeah some random inputs from the past. Um, yeah. Uh, a good example is, for example, it, um, it's important if, uh, so it's not enough if you take uh, the information about uh, the rainfall from, uh, let's say, the last days. It's also important if it was raining 10 days ago and, and not one day ago. Uh, ago. So it's uh, the sequence and where exactly what happened is important in the sequence. And there are uh, also many-to-many -many mappings. So um, on the left side, this can be, for example, used for forecasting. So you have an input, uh, a time series input, and you want to output a time, also a time series. This can be used, for example, for uh, sea level sea level rise estimation when you um, have an input of um, a few uh, weeks or months of uh, sea level measurements and you want to see how this will develop in future, in near future, and how the sea level will rise or not. Uh, also many, uh, on the left side, the many-to-many -many mapping, this is a um, typical example when you do video analysis or when you do a monitoring, for example, with uh, satellite images. Satellite uh, uh, have a repeat cycle, so you have um, yeah, repeated observations and when you think of the land cover and the land use, this would change over time. So this can be used for monitoring and you can use this uh, as input a time series and then uh, as output a property. So what you do here is you output at each time step um, yeah, what uh, a property or semantic segmentation map, whatever you want to have, taking into account the information from previous uh, time steps. Um, so I already uh, mentioned it that recurrent neural networks are uh, can be optimized by or the weights in in recurrent neural networks can be optimized by backpropagation, but 
The problem is, um, yeah, because you have so many operations in there um, and uh, these RNN modules are quite simple uh, that, um, yeah, the gradients will not um, flow that much and uh, no, not that much, but the, the gradient flow is not optimal. And also due to the structure of this recurrent neural network, it, uh, it turns out that it has only a short term memory, so it forgets really fast. So it, uh, an RNN, it's just simply multiplying um, the, the previous information and the current information. So um, yeah, it will very fast forget what, was, uh, what happened in the previous time steps. And um, yeah, so there are different uh, better possibilities and one possibility, a better architecture, a better module is a long short term memory network. And here, um, let's have a look at this repeating module, this green part, exactly the hidden part, what is happening in a recurrent neural network and what in contrast happens in a long short term memory network and why it uh, deals in a better way with the gradient flow and also uh, why it can keep a, a longer memory but also a short term memory. So let's have a specific look at uh, the middle part, this HT. And when you, when you illustrated what is exactly happening in a recurrent neural network, you will see that um, you have the previous hidden state HT minus one and the current state HT. And the previous hidden state is combined with the input XT from the current time step. And they are combined with the 10H functions in this RNN module. And this is the um, standard RNN module, very simple. And then you have this output and you, um, yeah. So when you compare it with the long short term memory network, you will see immediately there are a lot more operations going on, but um, all of these operations are making, making sense and uh, it will help you keeping uh, yeah, a, long, uh, a long term memory. An LSTM um, module is uh, behind there's the same principle as a recurrent neural network, but the recurrence formula is more complex. And um, so what you see here is uh, this uh, LSTM module. The violet blocks are pointwise operations, uh, a plus or a multiplication with the X. Uh, the, the light green blocks are, are layers, uh, for example, a sigmoid uh, layer or 10H layer. And there's a separate cell state C, which maintained, uh, which is maintained independent to what is outputted. So what is outputted, it's uh, actually from the hidden state and the output is the Y tilde T. And now you have a, uh, yeah, two separate state, the cell states and the hidden state and the, um, yeah, what is outputted is actually a filtered version of the cell state. And it makes, you will see, it makes sense that you keep this separately. And yeah, there's a whole information flow going uh, through this long short term memory cell. And um, yeah, I will go a little bit more into detail what is happening in there. But um, what is important uh, for you to remember as a take home message is that there are four main steps in, in this uh, LSTM module. So first, the LSTM learns what is relevant from the past uh, to get the desired output. Then in the second step, it decides what is important from the, as new information and this needs to be stored. So you have what will be forgotten, uh, what should I store? Then the old set state is um, actually updated to the new state. Here nothing new is learned, but uh, here the actual update step is happening. And the last step is uh, the cell state is filtered, which gives uh, the output. Okay. I want to go through it uh, with you a little bit more in the detail, but don't be afraid of all the, the math. It's just important is to, um, yeah, to remember that there are four steps and, um, yeah, different and all these four steps has, um, yeah, do some, do something important to have a, a long-term memory, a short-term memory and to, uh, yeah, to, to have a stable, um, 
time series analysis. So in the first, uh, the first step is the forget gate layer. Uh, so here the previous state and the input are combined and it passed through a gate. And this gate is uh, something which is um, uh, applied multiple times in this uh, LSTM module. And the gate is nothing else uh, than the sigmoid function. And what is happening with the sigmoid function, remember what I told you about the activation function, here any value is squashed between zero and one. So it's uh, the sigmoid can be seen as a gate uh, and it decides uh, with a value between zero and one what is getting through. So this gate is uh, yeah nothing else than the sigmoid function uh, and uh, with an after and and a multiplication. And in this gate, uh, it's zero when you want to forget everything and zero if you want to keep everything. In, then you have the input gate layer. So here you decide which new information is stored in, uh, in the cell state. Here you have this tan h, which is also uh, yeah, which was also there in the recurrent uh, in the recurrent neural network in the standard uh, version of it. Uh, again, you have a gate um, and yeah, some some pointwise operations, and uh, here. You, uh, yeah, you involved the new information and also the the previous hidden state, um, and then the actual update step uh, is happening. And you can see this uh, now. This uh, cell state, the separate cell state, is um, is involved, and the cell state is transported with some minor linear in the interaction. You see this uh, pointwise. Uh, yeah, operations, and it's it's a little bit like a conveyor belt, and the, the information is transported through this uh, this LSTM module. So in in the last step, you decide what is actually outputted, and the, the cell state is uh, filtered by going through uh, a tan h function and multiplying by the output of the sigmoid gate. So you have um, actually the the output and uh, y to the t and you have the hidden state which is the input to the to the next time step and yeah also involved is what was transported from uh, the separate cell state so you can go through it in more detail uh, by having a look and uh, actually see how this information flows but most important is that it contains these four steps so you have uh, what is important from the past, what is, uh, what is important from now, then you update, you combine it and update it, and as last uh, step, you output it. These are the, um, the main steps. To sum up, um, I showed you that deep neural networks need to be designed based on an application. And uh, of course you can use a standard uh, neural network, but it's very wise to use uh, um, a neural network which is especially designed to deal with uh, specific ca characteristics of the data. So if you have grid, gridded data and some spatial information you want to capture, it's a very good idea to use convolutional neural networks or at least at some point convolutions in any kind of network. So recurrent neural networks are super suitable to capture temporal information and it doesn't matter in the end if you um, uh, use a recurrent neural network or a long short term memory network. Of course it matters uh, for the information uh, or for the accuracy you achieve in the end but um, most important is that you use uh, a network which is able to capture temporal information when you have time series data. And also different networks can be combined. Uh, as I said, the convolutions can be combined with long short term memory network. And at least um, in, in the end, uh, it, uh, you can combine different kind of layers all uh, for, uh, for your application and um, yeah, for the intended tasks you want to solve. And 
with this, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, this advanced machine learning for remote sensing lecture with all the basics um, you will need uh, to, yeah, to start working with neural networks. It was a pleasure for me and I hope you enjoy, uh, enjoyed the, uh, the lectures and hopefully, hopefully we'll see each other in my next course. Thank you very much.